Hey, what's up, podcast? It's Jeff. Just want to jump in here. This is a special bonus episode of Teach Better Talk. This is actually going to be a the audio uh, recording from a Facebook Live that our team is doing every single day, Monday through Friday um, at 8 a.m. Eastern Time in our Facebook private group. You can get in that group at teachbettergroup.com or uh, go on Facebook and just search Teach Better Team. You'll see our page and then you'll see the group get in there. So here we go, a special bonus episode of Teach Better Talk pulled from one of our Facebook Live videos in our private group at teachbettergroup.com. Hope you enjoy. I'm so excited to get to jump on this week because I know Jeff hosted on Monday, Chad was in here on Tuesday. I get Wednesday and I have an amazing guest with me. Would you mind introducing yourself and telling us a little about what you do in education? Sure. Um, Well, my name is Victoria Wolders and I am from Langley, British Columbia, Canada. I was born and raised in Vancouver. So proud of being uh, Canadian and um, I am a teacher, a grade four teacher. um, And I also uh, run a website called mykidslocker.com. And I am a podcaster, so I have some really cool podcasts that are going on right now. Um, I have been running the podcast. What was that? You have a number of different podcasts. Yeah, it's just, it's been kind of one of my passions over the last year and a half, which is super cool. So I have the Empathy Tales um, podcast, which has been running for about a year. Um, I am a mom. I have a 13 year old and an 11 year old and I um, tell stories to them at their bedside. And so I created this magical world called the Oak and Eagle Kingdom. And um, these are stories all based on virtues, um, compassion and kindness and love. And um, they're all stories that have threads of different things from what I've gone through or things that I've heard or stories that I've experienced. And so I bed them into this magical fairy world. (laughs) And so what I've done is I've created the Empathy Tales podcast um, and it's meant for homes, but it's also meant for school. So as a grade four teacher, I've also used them in my classroom, which has been awesome. So yeah, so that's what I've been doing for about a year now. And then in, um, in January, I was with a team of people who launched um, the Teachers of BC podcast, which is through our local union, uh, the Langley Teachers Association. And so that's been awesome because we've been highlighting teachers from our area and uh, throughout BC. And that's uh, once a week. And that was through that's through kind of our BC uh, Teachers Federation. And then I also have just recently launched a new one, which is meant for what's going on right now, which is the COVID-19 pandemic. And that is called the COVID-19 Ed Podcast. And it's it's a podcast that has episodes Monday all the way to Saturday. And it's meant to serve those kids that are at home and learning. So it's it's a really cool adventure, um, kind of doing some digital trailblazing, but they are lessons and activities that are meant for kids. And uh, I'm just, yeah, I have a team of people that are working with me to do some episodes and yeah, they'll run all the way till July 1st. So Well, I cannot wait to dive into all of these pieces because in our daily drop-in, we're not only here to answer questions from people who are a part of our network, but also just like sharing all these resources that are accessible for people who are um, kind of like trying to power through, you know, solving educational problems while we're in this crisis. So um, I appreciate you sharing a little bit now. I know we're just getting people to pop in. We're actually streaming on Twitter right now. So my hope is that they can hear of us. Uh, So I want to make sure that we're trying to not only stream in our private group where you can participate live every single morning, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, but also just as a bonus this morning, streaming on Twitter, just to engage with our network a little bit more. Um, And then these actually, these daily drop-ins turn into 
bonus podcast episodes. They go up on YouTube. We share them on all social media platforms. So anybody listening right now, whether it be during our recording or after, can kind of catch all these tidbits and hopefully go subscribe and follow all the work that you're doing, especially in the podcast space as well. So um, as we slowly get into ideas, I do want to encourage those that are listening in our private Facebook group live right now to be posting some comments. I see that Alex is in here saying good morning. We have Kimberly in here, good morning. Uh, Jeff Gargas is showing up this morning. I'm proud of him, good morning. And then it looks like Lisa's popping in here as well from sunny New England, I love it. So um, I know that you talked about all these different supports that you provide in the podcasting realm, but you also mentioned that you're a fourth grade teacher as well. So would you mind kind of giving me some insight? Where are you at in your current role in education? Are you still in the classroom? Uh, have you guys moved to distance learning? Where are you at um, in, in that capacity? Uh, well, in the province of BC, we have mm -hmm. 68 uh, locals. We have 68 districts. And so I think like 67 out of the 68 are on spring break right now. Uh, so we're all on our second week of spring break. Um, there were some letters that were sent out from our uh, British Columbia Teachers Federation, as well as our Ministry of Education, as and also our local district, our Langley School District. But right now, there's a lot of uncertainties. We're not quite sure exactly what Monday will look like. Uh, many of us assume that we're going to go online. It seems like a lot of that is kind of just... Yeah, just it's kind of the undercurrent right now of a lot of our conversations that I have with uh, my colleagues. Um, but some of us are just still trying to enjoy our spring break, attempting to. <laughs> I totally understand. We're we're on spring break as well. So we had like last week, we had no classes. We were closed for the week. Kind of gave us um, some time to look at what e-learning could look like. We were kind of in this like standstill pause. And then this week we're on spring break. So I'm feeling very similar to you where Monday morning for all I know, we're going straight to e-learning, you know, with very little information within that transition. So I totally understand the the concern of like knowing what's coming. Yeah. And I, in our um, province of British Columbia, there are a lot of uh, discussions around um, the Freedom of Information and Privacy Act. And so um, a lot of our locals, a lot of our districts um, have started to move towards um, Office, six, Office 365, Microsoft, rather than Google. There are some, some districts that still do Google, but um, because Microsoft um, has kind of a hub and, you know, over in um, the East Coast, um, a server, they there's a lot of privacy um issues when we um when we talk about google so i know my district that i'm part of is fully microsoft office 365 so a lot of the chatter and chit chat on twitter and instagram and facebook is a lot about google classroom but i know my colleagues and myself won't necessarily be having those conversations which is quite different than most people i would say in north america most people are talking about google classroom so well, and I think that it's interesting now because we are watching communities from across the nation, across the country, across the world, explore what tech resource best suits them. And so whether it be, you know, groups that are looking at, you know, tech tools like Flipgrid or Seesaw, I'm doing a webinar with New Zella on Thursday, you know, those little things, or they're looking at like larger LMS systems where they're looking at Google or Microsoft, I mean, no matter where we are in trying to find tech resources, it's actually really interesting watching districts have those debates with their teachers to find the right resource to support them. Yes. Yeah. And there's just so many now. I know. So I do think that there is a high learning curve that is going to be happening in the next couple of weeks. You're right. Um, yeah. I mean, I think all of us, I can safely say all of us know how to email, <laughs> which is good. But yeah. the navigating the aspects of the classroom, and I know there's a lot of talk about what does a kindergarten class look like online? I mean, I teach grade four, yeah. so I'm hoping what I can do is, um, you know, I have a list of YouTube videos and, you know, we'll probably do a novel study. Um, but, you know, like, so there's a lot of different aspects that you can pull in, but, 
you know, how do you tangibly teach a five-year-old, right? Like there's, you know, or how do you do a chemistry class? Like there's a lot of different things that are kind of specific to what your grade group is, or maybe what your subject is. So for me teaching grade four, I have 30 kids in my class. Um, and what they've, what our province has said is that every, every kid will pass on to the next grade. So there also is this aspect of accountability. So, you know, if I have 30 kids and I have a number of them that might be dealing with family members that are sick or their parents have to work full time and they can't get to the screen, you know, between nine and 1130 in the morning or something. So what does that look like for them? And what does that look like for me? And so I just feel like there's a lot of a lot of great questions out there that all of us are trying to navigate, which is, you know, valid. We've never done this before. <laughs> we've never we've never well, done a pandemic before. <laughs> yes, and you're right that not only are educators trying to process through this, but also every district everywhere is kind of handling it a little bit differently. And I'm seeing that we're getting a lot of questions over on Twitter. If you want to participate live, feel free to pop into our private Facebook group. We'd love to kind of share what questions you have and then talk through those as a part of our daily drop-ins. But I'm hoping that these daily drop-ins can be those safe spaces that as teachers get information from their district and start to problem solve through the right solutions for our students, that this becomes an avenue for us to like kind of brainstorm how we're going to move forward. Because I know Tammy's in here, Andrea's in here participating, Candace is in here. They're all kind of sharing that every single educator that's participating right now is in a different space of, you know, some of them are on break. Some of them are talking about how they're using these great tech tools. And I think a lot of the discussion is in that student accountability because we not only need to hold our students accountable for learning, but we also want to enhance their time if they're not going to be in our classrooms. How can we continue to keep their brain thinking, you know, throughout, throughout, you know, this time where we can't necessarily be with them. Yes. Yeah. It's a, yeah, it's an interesting time. And I think, you know, one thing I've, I've seen a lot on, you know, on our digital platforms is the fact that people are kind of, people are coming together and I, you know, it's a horrible thing what we're going through right now. A pandemic is not something that we take lightly. Um, there's a lot of um, suffering and a lot of issues that are coming up. Um, but you see these people who wouldn't necessarily connect with each other starting to connect with each other. And, hey, you know what? I'm doing this and you're doing the same thing. Let's connect. And so there's something to be said about the beauty of that connection. Um, and I yeah. And I just also think, how do we navigate like the suffering, like the kids, right? Like the kids are going through stuff too, right? I, I think sometimes we get wrapped up with, okay, what's the latest thing that we're hearing on the news? And, but yet we have kids listening to this and looking at this and they're looking at us as adults and as educators and thinking, how are, how are they navigating this? What, you know, it may be a subconscious thing, but you know, we also as adults need to, and educators need to recognize like we're role modeling for our children on what to do in stressful situations. And so, yeah, I just think it's important to be able to also tap into those, not only the multiplication drills, but maybe we need to start talking about what does it mean to be angry? Because angry is a, anger is a secondary emotion. And so these are aspects that we don't really talk about so much as teachers because, you know, we're stuck, sticking to the curriculum, curriculum, but now we have to start navigating these feelings. Well, and I think I'd like to dive into that more. I know, by the way, if you are listening to our live recording, uh, at, in our private Facebook group, you can comment and be a part of this conversation, continue to add your thoughts and feelings, ask questions that you'd like us to discuss a little bit further and more deeply. If you're listening to this after our recording, whether it be a bonus episode on Teach Better Talk or you found this resource on our YouTube page, we just want you to know that you can always join in and participate no matter what. We really do want to be here as a resource. But I think you're alluding to this topic that I think is so important right now Whereas educators, we have had some time, not all of us, but a lot of us have had time to process through how we might consider approaching e-learning. You and I specifically in this conversation have noted that this week we're on spring break. It's currently Wednesday. So on Monday, we're thinking for the next five 
five days, how do we think we might support our students through e-learning? And a lot of educators are thinking through that content lens, but it's important that we focus on this, you know, social and emotional whole child well-being throughout this process as well, because as we've taken five days to process through how to support our students, they may not be in that same space. And so when they, you know, get back into this working school mode, how are we supporting that whole child? Um, I had a really interesting conversation yesterday with Jennifer and Hans Apple, which in my mind, they're part of award-winning culture. They are my SEL gurus. Like when I need to figure out how to really build in that whole child effect into my classroom, I think of them as my as my resource. So what are some things that you feel like you want to start with right off the bat to support your students not just with content, because co sure, we'll get to content, but really ensuring that they are safe and and um, and getting what they need in the in the emotional realm of support that they need throughout this time when you may not be able to you know physically be with them. Um, well, we're we're really lucky here in the province of British Columbia. Um, we started a new curriculum. Um, it's been in place for about four years now, and we have something called the core competencies. And so in that core competencies, we have um, thinking, communication, and then a personal piece, personal social um, competency. And so under that personal piece, we have personal awareness. Um, we have understanding of what it means to be part of a community. So it's our curriculum is quite groundbreaking in the way that we don't necessarily focus as much on getting through the list of you know, expectations. I feel like I'm losing out my words here, but we don't necessarily have to do like the nine times nine equals 81. You know, it, it, there's a little bit more of that, that piece where we, we, we can teach the personal awareness. We can talk about what does it mean to feel angry? What does it mean to feel sad? Um, and explore kind of more of a relational piece. Mm -hmm. So for me as um, a, a teacher in the province of British Columbia, Canada, um, I, I'm graced with the fact that this is part of my curriculum. So I can be spending a lot of time in the next couple weeks talking to the kids, doing check-ins on how are you feeling? How are you doing? Um, maybe even having side chats on Skype or, you know, some sort of medium or maybe picking up a phone call and talking to them because it's actually embedded into our curriculum, which is a beautiful piece. Um, it is. It is. It, you know, we're so lucky to have that. And, um, I know that some of us are, you know, some some teachers in different places of the world have to get, okay, we got to get through that nine times nine equals 81 for grade four. But, you know, in the end for us, if we want to kind of navigate our curriculum with the embedded piece on how do you feel, let's talk about it, then we do have the graces to do that. And in an elementary school setting, um, which I am at, I'm in a kindergarten to grade seven class, uh, school, um, I can do that. So... <clears throat> pulling in on a lot of YouTube videos and being able to get some books, I might, you know, like read the book Wander or like, you know, kind of do the, some, some, some books that do talk about the SEL part, the social and emotional learning. Um, but yeah, it's just, it's, it's, it's something we can't ignore. Like this is the thing. And I, and that's part of the reason why I'm doing what I'm doing with my podcast. So my, my original podcast was the empathy tales podcast which is really meant for my children. And I'm telling these stories that are integrated with perspective taking and integrated with um, kindness and care. And the actual empathy tale episodes all surround around this world called the Oak and Eagle Kingdom. And it's about these people who live up on land and then there's the water troll kingdom underneath. And the water troll king is often angry and he's misunderstood. And so he'll come up on land and the water trolls will come up on land. And so it's about what do, what do we do with these emotions? How do we navigate kindness and care and mindfulness? Um, I'm a big, big follower of Brene Brown. So a lot of her thoughts and a lot of the talk about empathy and shame are embedded in the stories. And then what I've done now with this new podcast called COVID-19 ed that was just launched on Monday, um, I've taken my empathy tales and I've created them into lessons. So on the Monday, I have a challenge, um, which is, you know, kind of a fun little thing, like on Monday was build your perfect school. 
And then Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, I have an empathy tale that I share. And then I break it down into um, an actual lesson where the kids listen to a mindful quote. Mm -hmm. They create something from listening to the story. Um, they do an activity. And then there is the final part, which is the innovate, which is an extension piece for the older kids or maybe the kids that want to challenge themselves something a little bit more deeper. Um, and so, and then on Saturdays, I've partnered with um, Happy Parents of BC, and they're going to be sharing a family activity that you can do for the for the weekend. So, um, so, so yeah, like I feel like when we, you know, when you talk about kind of that social emotional learning piece, uh, my podcast is kind of based on that, and the COVID nineteen Ed podcast is is focused on the fact that these are stories about perspective taking and about emotions. That these characters are having whether they're fairies or whether they're kings and queens and you know the water troll king and queen but you know how do we navigate that and it's the whole premise is, is trying to put positive narratives into the digital space because we need that so much we really do so i love this and i think that that's an amazing resource that all educators whether you're watching this in our private facebook group or getting a snippet today over on twitter um, I think that this is a great resource for educators to go explore because even if you teach a grade level that is above fourth grade or a grade level that is under fourth grade, this is still a, a valuable resource that any teacher could go utilize and bring into the classroom to teach that whole child. And I just want to celebrate the work you're doing because oh, you're purposefully, truly you're purposefully embedding this. And I think that that approach in not just teaching things in isolation, but really approaching this interdisciplinary model of embedding all these skills together is what we need to be doing for our students. Mm -hmm. You know, nothing in our world is is done through isolation except school. And so we can find mm -hmm. these ways to integrate these skills. You are you are totally speaking my language this morning. I love it. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I just, uh, my daughter is 13. And my son is 11. And for many people out there, we know that 13 year olds, most of them have cell phones. And so they're on social media. And so as a parent, I've had to navigate what does that look like for her? And so I, I just think that we we all have our different spaces on our digital platforms. But I just think that we really need to be aware of what we're sending out into cyberspace. Like, and if we can really focus on this time about positive narratives and modeling that to our kids, it's amazing. Like, you know, whether it's kind of a fun little TikTok dance or whether it's taking the time to say, hey, let's look at this quote or let's look at the story. Let's, you know, take some time to say, hey, I really appreciated you sending out that, um, you know, that tweet or I really appreciated you spending, sending out that Facebook post because I've really been thinking about it. And this is the time where we can really, I don't know, infuse social media with like these positive, inspiring, encouraging messages. And let's like do it together and let's do it with our kids. Like, and set that example. Do you know what I mean? That cyberbullying piece, there's a, you know, there is a lot of talk about isolation. Okay. So, but the one piece we do have right now is we have technology. So let's get on social media and as educators and as parents, families, let's start infusing social media with just positive, uplifting and amazing things that, you know, other people can see and be uplifted with. So. Oh, I love it. This is a movement. I love this. It's so powerful. Well, we are going to uh, quickly pause our conversation and say goodbye <clears throat> to Twitter. We've been streaming on Twitter for the first 20 minutes of our daily drop-in just to give our network a snippet of the work going on with our daily drop-in that happens every single morning, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday at 7 a.m. Central, 8 a.m. Eastern. So Twitter, really appreciate you. If you want to participate live and pop in, uh, we'd love for you to join our private Facebook group, which you can join at teachbettergroup.com. You just request to join. It's full of educators that are talking shop. And this daily drop-in is just one of the many things that our team has continued to try and do to kind of bring these ideas to life and talk about the ever-changing element of COVID-19. I'm seeing a lot of thank you messages. So thank you. I'm going to pause this over here. Um, 
We also have gotten a lot of um, comments that I think we could probably get to. Should we move over there and then maybe come back to this topic if people awesome. keep asking? <clears throat> awesome. So one that I know happened a while ago, but I had my cursor on it because I did want to address it. Um, there was some really good discussion in the comments so far in our live video focused on um, a simple tech tool called Seesaw. Do, do you use that app at all? So in our current district, we have um, a few teachers. And when I mean few, I really mean a few. Um, our basic e-portfolio is my blueprint. That's the one that we're working on right now. And that's the one that we're pushing. And um, yeah, it's all to do with the Freedom of Information and Privacy Act um, in Canada and in our province of British Columbia. So um, I do know of one teacher who was using it. Actually, sorry, I knew two, two teachers. But um, I also know of um, some private schools that are using them. And I know that there's a local a district, a sister, sister, a sister district, <laughs> sister district next to us, Abbotsford School District, that is using it. So um, I am familiar with it. Do you have, and I think it doesn't much matter whether you're using Seesaw or another, you know, another tech tool, this idea of having a digital portfolio. Leo, would you talk about that a little bit, how um, maybe an educator might use a digital portfolio in their classroom? And then depending on what tech tool they use, the, the, they're more or less all different as long as you have this idea of what you're trying to accomplish when you implement some sort of portfolio in a classroom setting. Yeah, so um, this is a great question because um, because I'm from the province of British Columbia, um, Canada, um, we have started something called a capstone project, which is for grade 12 students. And so what it is, is they are supposed to demonstrate their learning journey on what they have, you know, what they've learned over the last 13 years from kindergarten to grade 12. And so we've just started to really have that and having the kids showcase their understanding. And so when we talk about e-portfolios, this is a huge component because what's happening is now even kindergarten teachers are being asked, hey, start an e-portfolio, start my blueprint. That's the product that we're using. Right. Or for you guys, you know, start Seesaw. And so um, over the next, you know, 12, 13 years, that kindergarten kid that's in our, is sitting in the kindergarten class this year, 13 years from now, we'll be doing capstone and we'll have this portfolio. Now the online portfolio is a really great place to showcase kids innovative skills and it's very much of an individualistic kind of way of being able to describe hey i'm really good at this right like if the kid plays the trumpet really well there you go you know he's going to play the trumpet <laughs> you know or, or if a kid is amazing at you know um carpentry like maybe he'll you know carve something right so the e-portfolio they, um, you know, whatever platform you're using is an amazing opportunity to be able to connect kids' strengths, right? Mm -hmm. Because that's really what we want to do is we're trying to really tap into those strengths that kids have and say, hey, you can use this in the future for a profession or you can use it just even just for enjoyment, right? And so it's a really beautiful piece. I love the e-portfolio idea. So and I really love this idea of not only highlighting students' strengths, it's a great just documentation tool of where they are in their life right now. And that, it's, it's you know, it's a lot of ways similar to a long-term diary. You know, this is just a, a space where students are collecting memories, collecting learning opportunities, collecting messages to themselves. And I like this idea of using them in the future for, for a further project. Um, I know a lot of my students in my own classroom use their portfolio every single day to document what they did today, how well they understood mm -hmm. it, and their plan for the following work day. And so we actually revisit ours every single day to say, where were we yesterday? You know, where was our mental space yesterday? How did our work session go yesterday? And we use it as a reflection tool to help us be more successful the following learning opportunity that we have, which is sometimes, you know, later that day or even just the next day in class. Mm. And so I love seeing educators around the country explore having student portfolios because I think it's a safe space to document the, that student's progress. Do you agree with that? Oh, yeah, it's fantastic. And I think now with um, 
with the fact that we we have a generation now that is very you know is needs to be comfortable with technology right mm -hmm. it's about them taking a you you know a you know a video of themselves and then uploading it to an e-portfolio right an audio clip maybe they're starting a podcast right like there's so many great things that we can do with these e-portfolios and have other platforms and softwares and apps embedded into that um and you're right like it's very cool to be able to you know say to the kids hey do a reflection on what we've just learned right like it's a journey right it's that learning journey and i think it's so valuable it's just awesome yeah and, and tammy actually brought up a really great comment i do want to go back to Brittany's comment in just a second but for you know all of our educators that are participating live, we love that you're sending these comments. Please feel free to do that. You can add your name at the end so that we know who posted it, which a lot of you are doing. So we can tell there's professionals in here who pop into our daily drop in all the time. Yeah. Tammy notes that while it's great to use this you know e-learning platform and have the ability to have this portfolio space, she really likes that Seesaw allows the student to connect their portfolio directly back to the parents. And so it's also being used as a communication tool for students to not only document their success, document their questions and reflection, but also clearly communicate with parents as well because they're linked uh, to those accounts. And so I think that any any opportunity we have to use a device that or use some sort of technology um, solution to not only have us better communicate with students, but also better communicate with parents in that same lens can be a huge lifesaver as we continue forward in this unknown e-learning distance learning space. Well, and I think another piece is the fact that, um, you know, I have two kids, and you know, like I said, a 13 year old and 11 year old, and they'll come home from school and be like, so what did you guys do today? Nothing. And you're like, you were just in school. What did you do? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so I think the e-portfolio piece is an amazing conversational tool, right? Like, hopping on to whatever platform, you know, whether it's fresh grade or whether it's seesaw or my blueprint or whatever and checking in, Hey, you guys just did an experiment. You know, you did catapults today. Like, tell me about that. Like the piece where we're sitting at the table for dinner and it just brings more life. It brings more conversation. It brings more connection. Um, and you know, it's just an intentional piece. And I think it's, it's, yeah, it's awesome. It's the way we need to go. And I think it's not going away. <laughs> Absolutely. And I, you know, Randy adds, um, a comment here about a struggle she's having where she's tried to use Seesaw in her daily reflection with students, but it's week two where she's like kind of experiences learning from home. And she says that I can't get kids to use use it from home. So I have a few ideas for Randy, but do you have any suggestions, you know, if Randy's trying to implement essentially this idea of a new tech tool, um, but she's struggling to have students utilize it, do you have any suggestions for her kind of moving forward to maybe kind of fix that experience? Well, I think this is one thing that is the hard part about a situation. Like, you know, because we're in a pandemic, we're you know doing this distance learning or this remote learning mm -hmm. and we have kids that don't necessarily have the tech tools they don't necessarily have the parents that have those tech skills mm -hmm. and so we're gonna have difficulty with that and i don't know it's part about that ugh. like i feel like i wish i could wave my magic wand and say let's fix this but this is this is the piece that's so hard i don't know if i you know i don't know if i have an answer for that because i wish i did but at the end of the day, you don't know if, you know, the kid that you're teaching, I don't know, Sarah, her grandmother just passed away of COVID-19. Like, we don't know where the parents are at with their capacity. And so do you want to go down that road? Like, that's, you know, I know this is kind of a tricky conversation here because I know I know, I know education and doing e-portfolios is important. But do you want to reach out to them and say, hey, you know, you might be able to say, hey, there's some YouTube videos. Here's some resources take a peek. This is, you know, we're going to try to give you the tools in the toolbox mm -hmm. to be able to allow your child to put stuff on the e-portfolio. And I think you can do that as a teacher. I just, I, I just, my question is, is I wonder how much of that do we need to do? Like, do we need to email Sarah's parents three, four, five, six, seven times and say, Hey, haven't noticed Sarah's online. Hasn't, you know, 
it's 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 a very hard thing to do the accountability piece is just it's it's bizarre like how do you navigate that as a teacher i don't know and i don't even know as a as a parent that must be you know it's just it's a very challenging situation so but i think you touched on something really important one is that we don't know the situations that our students are in and every single household is, household is looking different in addition to every district looking different with e-learning. So I think, Randy, the first thing I would challenge you to do is trying to identify um, maybe what the what's stopping students at home from utilizing this tool. Uh, and then the other thing is to think about if, if it's not their environment that's stopping that tool, do we need to do more work to talk about why the tool is valuable? You know, going back to having the students fully understand why this integration of the tool is so vital to their success. Because if we can further emphasize that, you know, we need to use Seesaw, but not just because I said so, but really give our students the understanding of why as an educator are you requiring this tool? What value does this bring to the child? The more conversations we can have around that why, the more buy-in you're going to get from the student ensuring that they do it. So, you know, are you are you taking yeah. attention by them documenting their success in Seesaw? Are you um, use, utilizing this, this in some way that gives the student the perspective of, oh, that makes sense. That's why I really want to make sure I get this done mm -hmm. when I'm working on that content area. And so if you can partner with the student to have that understanding, I think you're going you're gonna to get more success with honey rather than vinegar, right? Yes. Oh, totally. And I wonder, like, you've touched on something really interesting because I think it has to be meaningful. Like in, in this day and age, like right now and where we're at, I think people are looking for meaning. Like, so, you know, I wonder if, I'm just curious about it. Like, I wonder if as teachers, we could start maybe embedding, okay, we're going to do the next 10 days of gratitude. Like take a picture of something you're grateful for. Oh, I was really grateful for that muffin that my mom baked me. Take a picture of it, upload it, right? Yeah. So it ends up, turning into kind of almost like, you know, a gratitude and it, it, it adds that virtue piece. Mm -hmm. And I, I wonder if we could transform this pandemic that we're in into like a meaningful journey for the kids, a meaningful educational journey so that, you know, 10 years from now, they look back and go, hey, I remember doing that online learning. I remember doing the e-portfolios and I remember doing that gratitude journal and I remembered that muffin. Do you know what I mean? I, I just, I, I think there's this piece of where, ki where kids and human beings themselves are trying to search for deep, deeper meaning during this time of struggle and suffering. And I wonder if we can tap into those kind of aspects of gratitude and empathy. And and I don't know what that looks like. <laughs> like I'm trying to trailblaze myself as a mother, as well as a grade four teacher. Mm -hmm. But I, I just wonder if we can just change the compass do you know what i mean from just the generic rote learning to hey let's let's embed some life skills here on when we're suffering we're going to lean into gratitude when someone's angry we're going to not necessarily look at that emotion we're going to look at kind of like that they're sad they're grieving it's a secondary emotion right so i just feel like we can do some life skills here and embed that in there and i wonder if that can be more meaningful for the portfolio piece does that make sense i don't know absolutely and i think randy you know she, she had another comment here saying uh and i really i love randy i've met her uh before and she does amazing work with her students and i want to push back on her comment a little bit she says it's not new for my students or or she says my kids and what she's alluding to, I believe, and Brandy, please comment if I'm wrong, is she's like, we've been using this tool all year long. I don't know why they're not using it right now at home. And my pushback, oh. just slightly to consider, is yes, you've been using this tool, but have we taken the time that we need to to teach our students the procedures that are now different because they're in an e-learning setting? So there's a lot of educators I've been collaborating with over the past few weeks that are like, well, I can move my classroom into a digital space. And I, I understand that belief. I believe that I have the uh, ability to do that at some scale as well uh, as I continue to progress with my own, you know, 156 graders that I work with. But I do, but I really do believe that we need to start e-learning 
fresh. And it doesn't mean that we cannot use um, the same procedures and skills that we've had in the past, but they almost need to be retaught uh, and re-emphasize the value because our, our environment has changed, our, our atmosphere has changed, and our students, you know, daily struggles, daily hurdles and distractions have changed. Mm-hmm. So we need to go back to teaching those procedures. And I think, Randy, that your students are going to have some comfort in saying, oh, Seesaw, I've used this before. I know how to do this. But we, we do need to start over and we do need to explain the value of why we do certain things. And it seems like that is time away from content, but it's really mm. not. Pinpoint those those mm. conversations now. We'll find more success as we move forward. Yes, yes. Oh, totally. And I, yeah. I mean, I think. I mean, when we look at what what's going to happen in the next week or weeks or months, like I think it's an awesome opportunity for us to be having those conversations um, with our colleagues as well as our students about we're using this platform to kind of document your learning journey and your life journey. Like that's kind of what we're doing now. We're really we we're kind of documenting an extraordinary event. I mean, this is this pandemic will be talked about years and decades from now. Like you know, and I just think, you know, yeah. I mean, it's. It's being able to also talk about to the kids about this this platform is important because dot dot dot. And I think that it's it's funny. I know we've talked about seesaw, but really this idea should be able to apply to any tech tool and any learning portfolio and anything else. I mean, the ability that we have to not only choose a tool that best supports our students, but but take the time necessary to explain why we've chosen that tool mm-hmm. is going to be something that all of our students need. And and Joe kind of talked about the value of recording videos and and how um, it really requires a lot of effort from the student. I think that the reason I like Seesaw specifically is because they choose the medium in which they document their portfolio. Mm-hmm. So the six different platforms, whether it be a video or typing or doing audio recording, there are six different mediums for them to move forward in their documentation. And so no matter what tech tool you choose, explaining why you chose it and what you believe it brings to the student throughout their process and using it is going to be the first step no matter what you know thing you're utilizing. It's just really important. Yes. Oh, totally. Yeah. I mean, I... Yeah, I mean, I would be interested to find out um, how many teachers out there are using ePortfolios because I, I, it's just a natural go-to now. <laughs> like when we're moving on to e-learning and remote learning, like I don't know. I mean, I just feel like the ePortfolio piece is just a huge component of what our journey is going to be educationally for the next couple of weeks. Absolutely, and I think having a place to track students is really a focus. And so whether using, you know, an, an virtual portfolio to track your students progress or using something else, just continuing to stay up to speed on not only our students um, learning, but also their social emotional state and, you know, other elements that they need is, is really important. Alex uh, posted a comment. He's an administrator in, in Illinois. He says, I appreciate the guidance from the Illinois State Board of Education. We can't compel only provide opportunities. Mm-hmm. And I think that really, um, yeah. then it's giving educators a little bit of grace that, you know, the work you're doing is important. We value you. And we know that we, you don't, you may not feel like you have as much control as you want. So how instead mm-hmm. can we provide opportunities to students to, you know, continue their learning? There's a quote, I'm not sure if you've heard it and I'm going to butcher it. Cause I, I, I don't know the whole thing perfectly, but if students had the choice, to uh, be a part of your learning that you're offering to students, those learning opportunities, would you be teaching to an empty room? And I think Mm -hmm. that that this is, it's it's an important time right now where students essentially have the choice to participate because we are not standing next to them, holding the pencil alongside them, making them, making them work. Right. So how are we adjusting our learning Mm -hmm. opportunities? How are we becoming stronger educators in what we can offer students and facilitate those deeper learning experiences. Are we doing that in a way that is um, inspiring students to continue their learning? Or are we simply still trying to check a box 
And will will we will we be losing our audience because of that? You know, do you have any thoughts on that idea? Well, um, yeah. I mean, I I've been teaching grade four for a while, and there's been an activity that I've been doing it. For, I guess for the last four years, my students called the STEM arcade. It's based off of Kane's arcade, where the kids take a cardboard box and they create an arcade game with it. And so it's always based on a science theme that we're doing over the year, or over term two. Um, but what I found is interesting is I always send out an email just before Christmas and I'm like, parents, you're going to help your kid with this. <laughs> like, this is a great opportunity to do family, like just do family. Like you're going to, you know, work, your child's going to need your help. And I, you know, my, you know, um, formative and summative assessment was based more on things that are done in class, whether they're orally sharing, it's not based on the product. Like, but what I always find every year for the last four years is I have these kids bring back these cardboard boxes that are like amazing, like arcade games. And some kids do them by themselves, but I would say 80% of the kids sit down with their parents and do them. The kids are so proud. And I think there's this component that of the family piece that we can really tap into now. I'm not saying that all parents are going to be home with their kids when they're e-learning. But I think the majority will be. And there is something to be said about the family unit that I think is extremely valuable. And so when we're doing our e-learning, I think we need to also tap into that if we can. You know, obviously some families don't have that uh, capacity. But, you know, whether it's, hey, you know, you know, after you hang up, hang up the e-learning, go to your mom and, you know, say, hey, let's go bake some cookies, you know. There is this piece of the family that I think is, is just extremely valuable and I think it's really important now, right? And um, this learning journey, what we're, we're in, some of us are in, some of us are still on spring break, yeah. but uh, we'll be starting next week, um, can incorporate and dovetail the parent perspective and the parent will be learning along with the kid. So, you know, I liked your analogy about like, you know, if you're teaching, like, would it, <laughs> would it be an empty classroom? Well, maybe as I'm curious if as teachers, we need to start trying to bring in the mom and the dad or the grandma or the grandpa or the guardian or the brother or sister into these conversations as well, because the learning journey ends up becoming from home and home is where there are other people, right. That are part of a family unit. And like, I'll tell you, like, I, I do these self-evaluations with these kids after this Keynes arcade, STEM arcade thing. Mm -hmm. And I have an overwhelming response of my favorite part was doing this with my mom. You know, my dad's in Japan right now. Uh, I can't, you know, he wasn't, he was able to help me build my, my cardboard arcade game during Christmas time. And these kids feel empowered. Like there's just this beautiful piece. And so I'm wondering if we should, you know, with your quote about like empty classroom, I wonder if we should just start shifting a little bit and start trying to navigate into like the whole family unit and incorporate discussions with mom and dad. And I think we can, I think we can start to do that now because it's remote learning and it's coming from their home, whether it's their kitchen or living room or bedroom or whatever. So, yeah. And then with that, I think, I think as teachers, we would have full classrooms because we have kids that are intentionally engaged because mom and dad or grandma and grandpa or whoever is is involved with their learning as well. I love that intentionally engaged. I think that the more we can build stakeholders and cheerleaders mm -hmm. for students, uh, yes. coaches yeah. can be on the sidelines, which is so important. You know, Victoria, we have talked about so many amazing things. I do want to make sure before we kind of wrap up this amazing conversation, I'm so thankful, so thankful you are willing to join us. Would you mind kind of sharing how can our listeners, whether they be participating live right now in our private Facebook group or after this recording when it goes on YouTube and becomes a bonus episode for Teach Better Talk, how can they stay connected to you so we can make sure we include that uh, everywhere in our show notes. Um, well, my website, mykidslocker.com is a great place to start. Um, you can go to that website and you can um, tap on the menu or if you're on a desktop, you can go to the, the subscribe button um, and you can put your email address in there and you will get updates on all my um, podcast episodes. 
And the COVID-19 Ed podcast just launched on Monday, and it will be an episode every, yeah, every Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, all the way till wow. July 1st. And it's, it's a great way for kids to be able to engage in storytelling and, you know, an activity, and it's a safe place. So there are some lessons that are going to be 10 minutes. The one that was uploaded yesterday was 35 minutes. And so teachers can jump in there and say, you know, oh, we have 35 minutes or we have 10 minutes. Kids, you know, take some time now to listen to this podcast episode. And also less screens. Like, you know, I'm a techie girl. I totally am techie. But our motto at My Kids Locker is less screens, listen, create, innovate. And so they can also connect with me on social media. Instagram, uh, Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, LinkedIn. I'm also on TikTok. My daughter got me on TikTok. And one last thing is the fact we have a mascot. His name's Snowball, and he does jokes. <laughs> he's our he's our fluffy rabbit, and he's super cute. And so I've started to upload YouTube videos and clips of Snowball, just encouraging um, kids to listen into the COVID-19 Ed podcast. And so I'd love for people to tap into it, share about it, COVID-19 Ed podcast. I love it. That is amazing. I want to make sure all of our listeners, whether it be on Teach Better Talk, YouTube, or live in our private Facebook group, are able to stay connected with you because I just think you're continuously supporting educators in, in a similar way that our team is by just trying to share really valuable content for us to better reach our learners. So I love everything you're doing. If you are listening right now and you're new to the Teach Better team, thank you for participating in this hour-long conversation that we've had for our daily drop-in. Our daily drop-in happens Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday at 7 a.m. Central, 8 a.m. Eastern. And it's only one of the ways that our team is continuously supporting educators. So whether you're looking for blogs, uh, free downloads, online courses. Oh, geez. Like we have mastery chat every single week. There seems to be so many different things that we are pushing out every single day to try and support this effort of educators trying to reach out to their students and provide them with as much support. And we want to be a partner along your journey. So you can go check out a lot of those details. You can get access to everything at teachbetter.com or teachbetteracademy.com. Victoria, thank you so much for being a part of our conversation. Oh, thank you. This has been amazing. It's just empowered me for the day. And I just I just appreciate you taking the time to, yeah, chat with me and listen to me. And I, you're doing good work. You guys are doing good work. And you guys are doing meaningful work. And I want you just to know that, you know, you guys are empowering educators. And those educators are empowering kids and families. So keep up the good work. Thank you so much for doing what you're doing in this time and season. Uh, and I hope someday you'll consider coming back and joining our daily drop in. Yes, to ask that would be I know lovely. Early, but we, uh, we appreciate you having me here. So sometime in the, in the future, we'll try and have you back. That'd be great. Thank All you so much. Thank you, everyone. And we hope you have a wonderful rest of your morning.